Good evening and welcome to the Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting for the evening of February 24th, 2014. Could you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Auglis? Here. Mr. Buffard? Here. Mr. DuPont? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Paul? Here. Uh, with the absence of Mr. Mazur, Mr. McGee is a voting member this evening. I think who was the first author. Um, First item on the agenda this evening is the approval of minutes of January 27, 2014. I move to approve. Second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? So four, oh, and one abstention. The next item, item number four this evening. We have a public evening, public hearing this evening. Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive input regarding a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance to repeal a contract zone 4 between the Town of Scarborough and Harold Burnham for property located off Bickford Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's nice to be here with the Board this evening. Um, I want to provide a quick overview of what um, this zoning amendment or repeal really of a contract zone is in regard to. I think as some of the planning board members were involved in a few years ago um, the town council and the long range planning committee did a <clears throat> fairly compre comprehensive rezoning of the Pine Point area and um, within the Pine Point area the property Many of the properties at the end of Bickford Street and Holly Street were rezoned for from what was an industrial zone to a to the TVC4 Town Village Center 4 district, really to kind of modernize the type of development that can happen in this area of town instead of being just an industrial district, uh, actually be a a mixed-use district that it could allow some residential development here um, close to the beaches also allow some light commercial and marine type um, land uses given the, the location of these properties and its proximity to to Pine Point and um, the, the town um, launch etc um, and when this was done there was an industrial overlay that remained that would apply to the Holly Street Industrial Park because there's some industrial uses that continue there. Uh, when the property owner decides to maybe change direction and develop in a different way, that overlay can be removed. Um, also, right next door on 24 Pickford Street, there's actually an old contract zone, contract zone 4, that allowed for a single family house to go on that property because at the time it was industrial zoned and didn't allow residential development. Now that the TVC4 allows residential development, the contract zone 4 really is, is obsolete, it's unnecessary um, because that use is a conforming use on the property. So what's before the planning board for consideration for public hearing is actually just to remove the contract zone 4 from the zoning map also delete it from the zoning ordinance and um, have the TVC4 be the only zone that applies to 24 Bickford Street. And in addition, um, there's, as you'll see on this map that's on the monitors and in your packages, there's a proposal to um, rezone sort of the panhandle or portion of 24 Bickford Street that is currently zoned R2, residential 2 to TVC4, so the entire property is zoned the same way, to follow the property line, so there isn't two different zones um, applying to this property. 
So that's what's before uh, the board, and the town council approved um, this amendment at first reading a few weeks ago after your review and public hearing. Um, it'll go back to the town council for their public hearing and consideration uh, under second reading in March. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, before I turn this over to the board, I would like to offer up an opportunity for a public hearing on this item. I would ask that if anybody would like to speak on this, please approach the podium, state your name and address for the record. We ask that you try to allow or minimize your comments, if you would, to five minutes or less. And if subsequent speakers um, <coughs> were to get up, then we also ask uh, that you um, keep in mind that the board has heard the comments from the previous speaker. Anything that you would like to add that would be new would be appreciated. Um, but we do take very seriously all the comments, so it is not necessarily necessary on your part to uh, repeat what's already been said. So with that, I will open that up to a public hearing. Anybody would like to, please approach the <coughs> at this time. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. And I'll turn it over to the board. <coughs> Corey, would you like to start us off this evening? Sure. I, uh, I really don't have anything to add. Uh, I had the opportunity to be part of this discussion as part of the Long Range Planning Committee, and I do support this, and um, I think it makes sense. Thank you. Tom? No comments here? All set? Yeah. Dave? Hey. Nothing to add. Going down the board, Dave. Just out of sheer curiosity, is there a reason why it went to TVC4 rather than an R2 district? <coughs> Was there some discussion as to why one was chosen over the other? Um, the Already, the majority of the parcel is zoned TVC4. Okay. Um, a contract zone actually is like an overlay district that applies on top of the zoning that uh, applies to the general area. Um, and the reason it was originally zoned to TVC4 a few years ago was it was prior zoned industrial. And so it was a, a change to TVC4 to provide some opportunity for residential development, but also some commercial development opportunity, because industrial provides that currently that, or in the past, that commercial development opportunity. Um, so that's why it initially went from industrial to TVC4. Thank you. That's it. Susan? No problems. I also have no issues with this at all. Uh, Heard it as well through the Long Range Planning Committee process. Uh, as a planning board member, I am actually not in favor of many contract zones because it really takes all of the power of the board away once a zone <coughs> is, uh, is actually established. So I like to see them eliminated, and uh, it makes the most sense to have this all follow with uh, the property lines so that we don't have a piece of property that has two different zones. So I'm totally in favor of it as well and would ask that, um, based on the comments, that we send a positive um, recommendation to the town council um, regarding the site. Any other comments? We'll move on. Our next item this evening, Good Rebel Holdings, LLC, Request a site plan review for a plus or minus 12,000 square foot indoor climbing facility on the Highest Parkway. Mr. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as the board is well aware, you, you've reviewed this project a few different times in the last few months. Um, they've been updating the plans and trying to address those, those comments at those meetings. I just want to highlight a few things in both the planning staff comments um, and site design comments, and then turn it over to the board and the applicant. Um, under site access, there's still a few more details to be worked out on traffic impact fees, just recon reconciling um, traffic generation. Um, the applicant still needs a modest approval from DOT on adjusting the location of um, the curb cut to Higus Parkway. Um, it's not a traffic movement permit or a significant permit, um, but given Higus Parkway is a limited access highway, there does need to be a, a slight shift in the 
access location and um, a change in the classification of the access from residential, which is um, the current use of that curb cut to a commercial um, access way. On the staff comments, it identifies a discussion point the board might want to consider on whether or not to extend the sidewalk that's on the site out to the um, common entrance into this site and to the rest of the Scammon property. Um, the applicant's narrative suggests that um, the clearing for the underground utilities was to be narrowed um, to provide more of buffering and less removal of the trees along Haggis Parkway. I think that's their intent. The plans just haven't been updated to show a 15-foot wide um, clearing rather than six, excuse me, 30 before. Um, and I think other than that, um, architecture has been talked a lot about the last few meetings, and I know they've provided the board with some new elevations and new information on uh, adjustments to those elevations and colors, etc. And that's probably the uh, focus of your discussion tonight as a lot of the other things have been um, updated and addressed as the board's review has occurred. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, my name is Mark Ritchie. Uh, I'm here with my partner, Fred Wilkinson. Uh, you represent Good Rebel Holdings uh, in the salt pump climbing facility. And I want to thank the board and the chair uh, for uh, rescheduling this meeting and saving myself from having to drive up from Boston in last Tuesday's storm because uh, I was not looking forward to that, but so uh, thank you. Um, so um, I think this is about the fourth or maybe fifth meeting that we've met here and talked about the project. And uh, we've um, uh, been working along with this board to try to bring this project uh, to uh, an approval uh, 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 of the site plan review. Um, I know that uh, we've had some challenges with the elevations and the facade. We went back to the drawing board with our, our worked uh, with our architect, Port City Architecture, and I think we've uh, uh, responded to a lot of the concerns that this uh, board had in the last meetings. So um, we've brought uh, Andy Highland here uh, from Port City Architecture to describe what we've done with the uh, with the architecture with the elevations. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Andy. Uh, but we also uh, would like to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the civil uh, um, design. So I think that would be quicker. So maybe we start with that uh, if that pleases the board. OK. So uh, Jim Fisher from Northeast Civil Solutions. <coughs> Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Jim Fisher with NCS uh, here representing our, uh, our clients and with Andy Highland here talking in a few moments about the, uh, the architecture. I'd like to uh, go over just very, very briefly. I don't think we need to rehash the project overall, but as Dan had mentioned, uh, I'd just like to reiterate that um, I do have a couple of comments regarding some of the, uh, the site considerations uh, pertaining to the civil aspect of the project. Uh, toward that end, uh, we would, the purpose of our, our being here this evening is ostensibly based on the pension of the board to receive final approvals with condition. There will be some. Uh, hopefully most of those will be uh, staff conditions, but again, that's up to the uh, will of the board. Uh, the, three in t the three aspects of what uh, the project that Dan had mentioned, just want to uh, address those really quickly. One was the, or the first one was basically the, uh, the DOT issue. Uh, it does require a, uh, just a driveway permit or an entrance permit. It's not required a full movement permit, so that's easy. Uh, the other thing is that the DOT was the one when we first went to them that suggested we put the access where we do. So they are in the process, the long process of uh, actually getting back to us. We know that we're not going to be building anything before the DOT permits come in. Uh, but given that they were the ones that initially said, you really need to put your entrance here and we understand what you're doing and this will be fine, we're just waiting on that permit, which could be tomorrow or several more weeks. We're just not sure. So toward that end, we'd like to be able to supply that to staff. And obviously, if there's any issues with it, we'll be back before the board. But other than that, um, we'd like to be able to just supply it to staff and staff would then review it and say, okay. The other issue is the sidewalk. Uh, one of the issues is sidewalk, as you can see here in yellow. Um, we did add the, uh, the sidewalk around the, uh, the perimeter of the building or the front of the facade of the building. 
Uh, one of the uh, connections I believe that um, the staff or the town per regulation is looking for is a an interconnectivity basically of sites. Uh, we would suggest that we probably don't want to have a sidewalk directly out to Hagas Parkway. That's probably not the best idea. Uh, as you all know, having, or as we all know, having traveled that parkway, the speeds can get up a little bit and putting uh, pedestrians right along the street would probably not be too cool. So what we did was uh, have the parking or the sidewalk as you see it. To the extent that it does need to get uh, extended, uh, that's not really a big issue. Right now there are no uh, sites or no, there's no improvement on the sites that are on either side of us. So if we were to uh, put a, extend a sidewalk out to the, the, uh, perimeter, the perimeters of the area, uh, ostensibly the sites on either side, they really don't go anywhere. In and of itself, that's not a consideration. However, if and when those properties do get developed, and at some time, hopefully they will be, uh, we're not really sure where, where that connection would be. So toward that end, um, we'd like to be able to continue with what we've got here, and if there's ever a connection that would then be required, perhaps less of a sidewalk than maybe a, um, a wood-chipped pathway, because it's still a wooded area, generally speaking, uh, that could connect, for instance, over in this particular excuse me, this particular section right here, this is the property line, and then over here just a little uh, jaunt down to this property line, and then we should be all set. Uh, the other issue, the final issue, is the, the landscaping that Dan was referring to, and that is the 15-foot width. It's a little difficult for you to see here, but we have actually done that with a new set of plans, and this corridor right here, which was, this is the utility corridor, as it were, how we're going to be getting all of our public utilities in from the Hagas Parkway uh, into our building. We had that initially at 30 feet. We didn't really need it. Uh, it's uh, as far as the width is concerned for the utilities and the ability for us to be able to actually get in there, minimize the impact uh, as far as cutting any of the bushes or the trees. We did figure we could get that down to 15 feet fairly easily. That will be, according to the landscaping plan, that will be replanted, albeit slightly, because you don't want to plant anything too large over uh, public utilities in case we have to get into them again. So again, we've narrowed that corridor, as it were, to 15 feet, which I believe was the request of the board and then the landscaping over the top of it will be landscaped, but it will be fairly minimal. Given that, that really addresses all the issues that we had uh, from a site civil perspective. So again, we'd like to be able to uh, address any questions or comments that you might have kind of going backward about the, uh, the landscaping uh, corridor, which is fairly easy to take a look at, uh, the sidewalk issue, and then again, the DOT permit that we will receive, obviously, before we need to do any construction out there, and we'll give that to the staff, and then we'll go from there. Toward that end, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you. I think we'll hear the whole presentation before Great. I turn it over to the board. Then, at that point, turn it over to Mr. Highland, and he'll wow you with details on the architecture. Yeah. Turn the monitors on, I guess. They're on. They are. Oh, okay. I'll Maybe. turn my computer on then. Yeah, that might be it. Work it that way. Ah, uh, there we go. So um, again, I'm uh, Andy Highland at Port City Architecture, and uh, we've been working uh, with uh, Mark and Freddie for a while doing the construction uh, documents for the project, and uh, they brought us in also uh, to uh, try to help them uh, with some of the uh, exterior of the of the building and the facade uh, as well. So uh, what you're seeing is kind of the results of uh, of our endeavors uh, on it. Um, I guess I'd like to start with so this is uh, and and this view here is uh, is actually out from uh, the parkway but there's I took a lot of the trees out just to kind of give you kind of an idea of what the building uh, looked like maybe go into a oops, sorry these aren't in the right order here uh, a little closer up uh, shot of the of the project so this is the the front entrance uh, uh, that uh, faces the parkway. Uh, and, and we started with really kind of took a look at it from scratch, as Mark said, uh, you know, kind of taking a look at the volumes of the space, kind of what we would, what we thought they were pretty open to kind of just getting our input on the whole, on the whole piece of it. As, uh, as if any of you know any of the other projects that we do, it's probably a little bit of a departure from Port City. We're a little more... Uh, New England looking typically in a lot of our projects. But, but as I took a look at this space and kind of the needs of it, you know, it's a rock climbing facility. Uh, it needs to have a big volume. The uh, top portions, uh, the, the larger portion on the left, 
Uh, for the interior climbing walls is about 47 feet to the to the peak of the ridge there <clears throat> and the right side is about 29 feet the whole building's 50 by 200 so the the program requirement is that size of a of a box and kind of that's what I start with you know here's what I need inside and anything else that we apply to it's got to be on top of that or outside of that so to really put, you know, a lot of, you know, peaked roofs, things like that on this building would have increased, in my mind, the scale of it, you know, enormously. So what we tried to do was say, you know, let's try to bring down the scale, make it a little bit more pedestrian, um, and, and add elements that give it visual interest on the outside, but kind of keep it true to the function that's going on inside, and, and to also, uh, like I said, just break up the facade and, and uh, you know, work to, to give it more interest. So what we uh, what we started with, we kind of sat down and, and thought, well, it's climbing facility. What kind of materials? What kind of you know, would be appropriate? And we kind of came up with a theme of uh, well, you know, you climb on rocks and stones. So we came up with the theme of maybe faceted uh, stone projections uh, on the outside of the building, and uh, and the uh, material. The base material being a vertical, a linear uh, metal, which kind of give you the idea of trees in the forest, and then these other elements uh, that give you more of an idea of kind of stone and faceted uh, uh, stones. So, uh, looking at that, we've used some new materials recently. Just put this on the dental school in Portland. These are uh, this is a real porcelain tile that's an exterior. A cladding material, and uh, we like it. It's it's durable. It's it's real uh, porcelain tile. It comes in five foot by ten foot sheets, and just about this this thick right here. And it has a very nice look. It's not shiny. Uh, it comes in an, a number of different colors, and we kind of like the one that we're looking at here. And then it kind of gives you that stone appearance. I can kind of pass some of these. Big sample or little sample? Okay. It's up. It's up right now. Like I said, in a in a. Uh, that's going to be the windows and a little accent around the uh, the windows and the door frames. So that would be what I'm looking at. So yeah. Let me see if this will uh, if it doesn't uh, laser off and blind you guys. So everybody, be careful here. But this, the just kind of window uh, door and window frames in here, just as a little bit of an accent for a little bit of color uh, in the in the project. The the stone material is all is these faceted pieces, and the other the other uh, we're trying to stay true to the function inside is uh, that there's not a lot of place for real windows because a lot of the inside walls are, are you know, already formed in the rock climbing uh, materials. So putting a window in would just light up kind of the backside of the, the rock faces that are on the inside. So w we went through and, and really kind of found places where windows really did make sense, that they could light up the interior of the facility. Put a clear story on the top here, on the top here. This is between a couple of facets uh, right in, in that area. Maybe I, I can use this one for the audience, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the main entrance, which kind of runs right through the middle. Uh, get to the next, next one here. Oops. So this is kind of more of a close-up. On, on this end right here, I guess I'll go over here, we didn't have a, uh, there's really, it's just completely lined with the, with the rock face walls. So what we wanted to do here, we brought out these faceted materials, and then and it goes, it's, it's got a lot of relief, and what we're looking at doing is maybe a backlit light fixture. Uh, where We have a, um, so it's a kind of, little square trellis, uh, uh, galvanized trellis that it's going to go up in the back here. And we're going to try to bring up some vines and <coughs> some appropriate materials that'll bring the, bring the green then up into, into the uh, uh, area and bring kind of the ground and the vegetation up. So we get 
the, the trees, the, the stone, and then trying to get the vegetation uh, in some of these areas to give it some more interest. So <clears throat> the light fixture, like I said there, would kind of backlight this at night. It would be a nice uh, feature, soft. The other thing we were looking at in the materials as you kind of look as they go by you was try to keep it, uh, keep it a natural palette too, to not go with a lot of really you know, crazy colors on it to make it a little more timeless. Uh, and, and just the building itself and, and just natural uh, looking colors uh, to blend in with the landscape. Let's see, some other, losing my mouse here. <clears throat> On the rear of the facility, we uh, brought the same uh, materials around. This is another window bay here. Uh, this, this one is the kind of back, there's a little back porch that you can step out to uh, overlooking that little pond area in the back and had a, another, some room for windows uh, in the back uh, as well. What we try to do on, so the two entrances are the, the front entrance that kind of creates this bar that, you know, kind of runs right through the two windows when you walk in, you'll be able to see right through the facility out to the pond. And we brought these up higher uh, on each side, and that's where that's the, all the mechanical equipment we located right in that kind of crook. Yeah. Uh, the mechanical, so, the, so this, is si uh, this is this piece on the back that we brought up. We did the same with the front. Let me get back to there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this area right here is brought up higher than the roof. And right in between those two is the mechanic, all the mechanical equipment we lined up and screened uh, right behind these two, the two kind of front and rear entrance pieces. Uh, I always like to uh, incorporate the signage instead of trying, you know, as an afterthought thinking and sticking it on the building somewhere. Uh, we put it on over the front door, incorporated uh, a band. So there's a, a, a metallic band that goes in the same color, the darker color that'll go and cut out letters that'll be kind of backlit with the salt pump uh, logo on the front. And we'll light the insides here so in the evening it'll be a nice glow at the entrance with the signage, uh, with the light from the inside of the facility and glow uh, down into these kind of little faceted uh, planters that uh, go on the outside. Uh, let's see. So again, we looked at, you know, we, they gave us kind of pretty much, uh, you know, let us do what we thought was appropriate with the whole facility. I looked at, you know, we looked at all sorts of different sizes of this, bringing these up tall. When I did that, it just really started to accentuate the height of the whole facility. I think I, we tried to line these up more in, in, the, in a similar line. And especially to try to unify the two because, you know, you have this large half and small half. So we tried to use these materials to really, you know, bring across a line that really unified the lower half to the upper half and brought it down. I mean, it's still, they're still tall, but brought it down, you know, from the, from the large height. And I think the effect is going to be that you're really going to kind of focus on this nice material in the entrance. Uh, and, and these couple of elements on the front and the rest of the building will just work as a backdrop uh, to the, uh, to the uh, project. Uh, let's see if I have any other. I think that's, uh, and if there was any other items that I wanted to go in, uh, screen the mechanicals, uh, you know, again, working in, in, uh, in scale. Uh, we brought these out. This one comes out about five feet, so we did bring it out a pretty good depth. These facets come out about almost to three feet at the point, so there will be some good shadow lines on the building, uh, and I think it'll be some interesting shadow lines too as they come out in, uh, in you know, kind of angles instead of just uh, square boxes and give it that more organic, uh, organic look. So I do have a. 3D model here. These are just still shots of it. Um, if you, it's it's a big file and it works a little bit slow. But if you were interested or wanted to look at something from another angle, we can, uh, you know, kind of go through to some other shots if you're if you're interested. So that's uh, 
like I said, it, it, it moves slow, but we can kind of move the move it around if we need to. So that's uh, that's the architectural <coughs> portion, and we're happy to take uh, questions as well. Thank you. I think it'll move. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Ah, yeah. See, takes a little while to regenerate. There's the me the mechanical units okay. again up in between that you can see. You know, between these two uh, pieces, the entrance canopy and this one that'll hide those. They can get out. There's a door uh, on the on the end right up here that they can. You know, we've incorporated a ladder, and they'll be easy to work on in the top. Uh, the, and that's the clear story lighting. This is again the the rear of the project in the back. And I think it makes a nice, simple design. I think it's got some visual interest. It'll have good shadows on it and. Uh, we, we feel it's a real appropriate uh, solution. So thank you. Thank you. Does yep. that conclude the presentation for the applicant? Or? I, uh, yes, it does. I believe that does. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn it over to the board. Dave? Thank you. <clears throat> I like it. Uh, I think it's a big improvement over what we saw last time. Um, when I look at this, I definitely don't see a building that looks like in a, a warehouse. Uh, so I think you've done a nice job to greatly improve the appearance. Uh, and it, it kind of, to me, looking at this, it kind of draws me in as far as my interest is. Uh, looking at the building, you know, I'd, I'd have the, you know, the, uh, the thought that, gee, this is interesting. I wonder what's in there. You know, it's. Uh, I think you've done a nice job. Um, so I have no issues. Thanks, Dave. Change things up a little bit, Corey. So, oh, all oh, right. Oh, Got your <laughs> um, no, I, I think you. Um, I think you really hit it out of the park on this, in my opinion. Um, I think it's a huge improvement, and um, I think it. As, uh, as you said, it adds a lot of visual interest. It does sort of draw you in. Uh, and I think you've succeeded in <coughs> sort of breaking up the building and, and adding interest in a way that doesn't seem arbitrary, like just sort of adding a band to break up uh, a, a, a long stretch um, of blank space. And um, I also, I think it's just a very thoughtful approach overall, like the, your solution for screening the mechanicals. Um, and again, it's it's something that I like the fact that it's all sort of integrated and and, and functional. Um, so, in my mind, anyway, um, the I think you've solved the the architectural problem or risen to that challenge, and really appreciate the the extra effort there. Um, in terms of some of the other items, the some of the sort of site or civil related items, um, it sounds like those are either being addressed or uh, on their way to being addressed and to the extent we need to maybe wordsmith something in, in conditions if we get to that point around exactly what, um, how we leave things with pedestrian connectivity. Um, I, I think we need to at least make provisions to, to, have, that, um, to have that possible at some point. Um, but beyond that, I don't, don't think I have anything else. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. I, I like what you've done. It turned out real nice, guys. That's, that's all I have for comments. Thanks, Nick. John? I agree. You've done a good job. It's the first time I was certainly opposed to the other design. Um, so I'm pretty much for this. Uh, I noticed the increase in height from 44 to 47. Is there a reason that had to be increased? Yes. Uh, could you go to the mic, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Um, yeah, we've, uh, after surveying uh, rock climbing facilities across the country, we felt that uh, to produce a state-of-the-art climbing facility, which is what we want to do, we needed to go a little bit higher um, to encourage inter uh, national competitions. We need the uh, leadable rope length of, uh, that we get in 47 feet, so that's the reason. All right. That makes sense. Okay. Other than that, good job. Thank Very you. Very good response to what we wanted. Thank you. Susan? 
Boy, am I pleasantly surprised. <laughs> um, having just come onto the board, I had been told by little people here and there that the big problem was the, was the design of the building itself, the exterior of the building. And I didn't know what I was going to see. But this is really very creative. I do have a question. The, the thing you passed around, the dark material mm -hmm. is what's going to go around the doors and the windows? Yes, correct. Okay. The orange, if you will, orange. <coughs> yeah, the, the, uh, going to go around the kind the of brick uh, brick color is the metal of the, the there'll be aluminum well, the windows. The is the exterior? Yeah, yeah, yeah. D yeah. Somebody, oh, I'm trying to keep it kind of, uh, you know, muted and, and natural. But it's, but it's got lot, it's some. Um, yeah, it'll be a vertical. Uh, we're looking at different, uh, you know, co some different sidings. Uh, uh, so it'll be a, a good quality. But it uh, won't be flat like this. Oh, no, no, no. But That's just for color. color. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's take pictures of this and put it, on, put it in the file. <laughs> um, I, for some of you may know, I spent an awfully long time on this board at one point in time. And I, from one of the experiences we would have is that what we were looking at would be great, but then mm -hmm. what went up. Right, right. You know? Well, you can keep the so, sample. No, I don't want Dan, to he can, it, Dan can, <laughs> Dan can it lock it up. I want to the file just to make sure it comes out, but it's a very, it really, well, what I like the most about it is that the, the Hikus Parkway was about quality, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have, it never said it had to be New England. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And this is quality. Right. And I, I really like it. Um, just going to double check. You really are sure that those added height on the front and the back is going to cover the mechanicals? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm good, yeah. Okay. I wouldn't lie to you. <laughs> no, you haven't yet. I, I've been um, good, yeah. <laughs> um, I like That's the a note to self on the construction administration. I'm yeah. going to make sure that that covers. We're pretty good at yeah. sniffing out yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. I love the fact that it's not shiny. Yeah, yeah. It's a neat uh, material. Like I said, we just used it. There's a, a black version of it. We just did a new dental college in, uh, at UNE yeah, in I Portland. It's wonderful. And, uh, and it has a black version of that. But it, it's really impenetrable. It uh, needs no maintenance. And right. it's going to give you that nice kind of stone look. I, it's, of course, I said, of course, another product from Europe somewhere that we've uh, now. It's, this is our American version that we of course it picked is. up. Yeah. Um, I really like the additions to what you've done on the side and the lighting. That is really going to make a difference, a big difference. Um, putting vines or something in there, does that need to go on the, the um, landscape plan, I ask staff? The fact that they've created, as a result of this, planters in which there will be it should I don't know if we've had time to we we've well, communicated guess, with the with our our civil well, I'm not saying that we necessarily have to have that decision right uh -huh. here but when the decision is made does it need to be added to the landscape? I think for the benefit of the landscape installer as yeah. well as staff when we do the inspection it'd be useful to know okay. species and quantity just to everyone's under the same understanding. We, we expect it's kind of a, a, a system actually out there that does like a green wall. Right. So we, we've got, it's like a two-sided, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know, kind of mesh and with a solid piece well, that'll sure go we, in my, there. My only question was to make sure that it's actually written in okay. and very clear yeah. what it's going to end up being. Okay. Um, I'm looking at that point where I can't see it with my glasses and I can't <laughs> see it without my glasses, mm -hmm. but I'm looking at a reduced version of the site plan. And the clearing for the front of the building, this is not to the, this is not to the um, architecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> it says, selectively clear understory vegetation, remove trees under four inch caliber and all shrubs under 30 inch in height. I think that what we're trying to get at is to not have it look the way it does now. Yes. Which is, you know, like totally unkept. But it's my opinion that we might want to go back and take a look as to whether we really have to take out four inch caliper trees. I mean, I know we want to be seen when we go by, but if you were to landscape something new, a four inch caliper tree is probably what they'd plant. Hmm. Um. 
No, no, you can answer yeah. anything. I mean, I, I'm new to I'm I'm new to this is the first time I've seen this. So if I'm asking something that's already been decided, just let me know. Essentially, most of us who have. Most of us who have, uh, are very familiar with the Hagus Parkway know, as Susan had mentioned, that uh, it's rather wooded mm -hmm. uh, the, along the entire way. And it tends to be rather, for lack of a better term, scrabbly. And there, there's not a whole lot of uniformity there. Uh, and it was natural. It wasn't uh, specifically planted. So what we're looking at doing in some of these photographs, this is the, the pictures that were just taken this past uh, autumn. Uh, and what we're looking to do, as Susan had mentioned, is uh, clean out a little bit of it to a certain extent so that people can identify it. Right now, the woods are relatively thick to the point that if anybody's driving by the Hagus relatively quickly, they're going to go right by the entrance. Having said that, however, there are quite a number of standing trees, large caliper trees. Uh, some of them go up to uh, over 30 inches. So starting from the top, as it were, the larger caliper and coming down, uh, we plan on uh, retaining those larger trees, and you'll see that on the plan. Uh, and as they are identified here, there are quite a number of them that we plan to uh, to keep. Um, specifically, those that are uh, are highlighted here uh, throughout this particular section. We want to be able to keep as much of the natural quality as possible, but still be able to thin it to the point where uh, people can see through to this building that is quite aesthetic and pleasing. I understand the concept. My questions are very specific. Okay. Orange caliper. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It is not clear to me what this is going to look like. When, I mean, I, we don't want it to look the way it does now. Yes, I quite. Agree completely. We do want it to re look like it was originally a wooded area, however, and not just a sparse or not just tall white pine trees. If there's anything else out there. Sure. Okay. So I just want to make sure that under four calipers is not too small, and I also wonder. Says, what is what is going to be left when the trees, when the, when the, we have the tall trees there? Yes. If you take out everything, four inch caliper and down, what's left? Well, we're not taking out everything, um, but uh, those that we do take out, which are the, let's call it what they are, they're kind of the weed trees, as right. it were. Um, to be able to clean I'm up just that area. i figure out whether we need to put something else back in as oh, a result of what you're taking out. Absolutely, and we are doing that. And you'll see based on the, the planting schedule up in this okay. area, um, these are corresponding, these are the, the, the common names, the Latin names, the numbers that we're looking at, et cetera. And you're going to go right there in the front. And yes, they are identified, well, not just the front, they're identified as over in this area, um, then down in this section over here, and then across the front. So it's not just the front that we're looking at. But yes, we do plan to augment, augment these. Uh, the, what we take out with specific planted uh, landscape materials. It's going to look very nice as far as the aesthetic is concerned, which is easy to say, but that's what the planting schedule is for. I think my problem is that I'm not accustomed to seeing anything this small. When I was on the board before, we had those great big plans, and everybody was overlapping everybody else's, and papers were being flown in the air all the time, and it was very, very difficult. And this is ever so much easier, but I can't read it. <laughs> So I can't really tell what's going to be left, but I trust you. Thank you. I, I think it's, you, you know what it is we're looking for. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. I and just don't want to have anything taken down that doesn't have to be taken down. And we agree, absolutely. There are just there's so much of it right now. It's very profligate okay. as far as the amount of just stuff that's kind of naturally that's packed mm -hmm. in there, and we would like to clear that out selectively and okay. then replant so it looks even better. Those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, just a few comments, if I might. Um, I, as well, appreciate the architectural changes, where we came from originally to where we are today is two different buildings. Conceptually, they're the same. But structure or the physical appearance of the buildings are substantially different. So thank you. We appreciate the efforts that you put forth. Um, and we know that you have worked hard to do that, and we thank you for those efforts. Um, <clears throat> a couple of my questions, and, and from an architectural standpoint, I guess, is there any concern about ice or anything coming off the roof with, in terms of location of sidewalk or 
here we are in this lovely Maine winter, and I'm seeing stuff flying all over the place off roofs at times now, and so I'm curious to yeah. see if there was a consideration given to that. Well, uh, yes, I, I, I always give consideration to that in Maine. <clears throat> That's the bane of uh, being an architect here, is having icicles hanging over the entrance. This, uh, the whole roof on the on both sides actually pitch pitch away and down into the sides. So, the the there's a flow and a and drainage off of this roof, not to the front or to the rear, but to each end. So we've we've done the pitches that way, and each of those ends is uh, pretty, there's no sidewalk and no, uh, okay. no areas out there. So, so yeah, we're we we feel that that'll be good. Uh, you know, a good solution, right. and, and just shallow pitch, so it's not going to come screaming off either. Okay. Um, one of the other items that was mentioned at one point in the write-up, and I don't know if we've come to any conclusion on it, was that there was going to be some additional traffic movement counts from the Newburyport facility, I believe. Yes. Have we done those, and do we know what they are? We have done them. We do know what they are. Bill Bray is our traffic engineer, and he has uh, recalculated the impact fee, which is slightly higher than his calculation from before. Um, as you mentioned, Alan, the, um, what we had before was out of the book, basically, and because we have a facility that is uh, somewhat akin to this one, to be sure, in Newburyport, uh, he actually went down there and did counts twice uh, just to take a look at the, the peak hours, which typically are the peak time period uh, remains to be seen essentially but generally speaking it's a it's a uh, facility that is probably going to attract the preponderance of its crowd in the winter time uh, for lack of anywhere else to go and do this kind of thing so toward that end it was actually a perfect time these counts were done in January and February by the way uh, so it's very it's a perfect time at this other facility just to take a look at uh, how much traffic they actually generated the answer to your question is we have that report we will provide that to staff uh, and it does have the recalculation of the impact fee. So that is completed. That takes care of the impact fee, which is great. My concern being the larger one is the parking situation. Are we still good in terms of what we think we're going to see for traffic, heavy, heavy peak traffic, if you will, and how that would uh, relate to the parking spaces that we're providing for the facility? Are we still comfortable with that piece? Yes, very comfortable. Not only is the information that's out of the book um, help us toward that end, which is relatively generic and it's applicable throughout the country, but now that we actually have a specific, as far as the Newbury, as far as comparison is concerned, in the Newburyport facility, uh, when B Bill redid his calculations, it actually went up by two tenths um, as far as the uh, traffic that's being generated in a peak hour, uh, which is almost negligible. So toward that end, the answer to your question is yes, we're very satisfied that the parking we have right now is still going to be more than accommodating for the, uh, the number of people that we expect to have there. Okay. I mean, I, one of the, the difficult things here is that we have a very unique building with a very specific purpose that, you know, should it become something else down the road, trying to make sure that the infrastructure, if you will, that we're putting in place might still be adequate for that uh, down the road. Uh, but as I've indicated in the past, we don't want that to be the case. But one of the things we have to consider is how else might this facility be used at some point in time. So Certainly, that's what planning is all about. And that's part of our dilemma, if you will, with some of the architecture pieces. Um, that I think that you've really done a very nice job with. So. Mr. Chairman, could I just to respond to that? Please. Um, the, uh, the climbing gym in, at, uh, that we're talking about in Newburyport is actually in my building, so I'm quite intimate and familiar with what goes on there. Uh, it's a climbing facility of exactly the same size, 10,000 square foot facility as ours is. Um, uh, arguably in a very similar um, demographic region, Newburyport. Uh, it uh, has 32 parking spaces, and we have never at any time exceeded that at one given time. So our facility has 45, so we feel comfortable that we have adequate uh, overflow and uh, sufficient um, uh, for this facility. So, okay. No, thank you. I appreciate okay. it.
Any other concerns or questions from the board, Susan? I forgot. I'm a little um, confused about the sidewalk piece. I understand not doing anything right now, but is there a way, is there any issue that the, that the staff especially can see about, well, when something goes in next door or when a sidewalk becomes, some, uh, becomes necessary that wanted, that the applicant will then create their sidewalk. Yeah, we, that, that become a condition? Is it? I think we have a condition. That we do have a condition that. for that. Yeah. You haven't okay. seen it yet. No. Thank you. You, you answered statement. my question. Then thank okay. you. Any other concerns? Uh, no. Wasn't there a wasn't the fire department concerned on that turnaround? Was that yeah, perhaps? that's been um, revised, and they've reviewed it, and they're satisfied with the, okay. the updates the applicants made on the turnaround. Okay. Thanks. I think staff concerns have been generally met. And yes, and, and not being aware of Bill Bray's latest updates on traffic, there is a drafted condition in there okay. about that. Maybe it's obsolete already, but if it is, then they've already met a condition before it's. You'd be happy to approval. have that as a condition. But it, it at least also by putting it in here, I think also gives our uh, peer reviewer a chance to review it. Sure. If that is necessary, so I don't see it as a, I don't think it's an issue here. I don't see it as just hey, Mr. Chairman, just for your information, we actually have that report that I'll give to Dan this evening. That's right, completed. So. Appreciate that. Anybody else? All right. I'd like to place a motion that the Planning Board approve the application of Good Rebel Holdings, LLC, represented by Northeast Civil Solutions. Under Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, and Chapter 405B, the Town of Scarborough Site Plan Review Ordinance, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings. Good Rebel <coughs> Property Holdings, LLC, proposes to develop 1.45 acres on the southern portion of the property located at 36 Highgate Parkway, which is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map R50, lot 24. The site has 360 feet plus or minus of footage along Hygis Parkway and will have shared access from the Hygis Parkway with the remainder <coughs> of the parent parcel. The property is located within the Hygis Parkway zoning district. The site plan has been designed to accommodate a rock climbing facility in a 12,000 square foot plus or minus building along with the associated site improvements. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. The Planning Board has reviewed the architectural details of the proposed structure and finds that the building architecture and site layout are in accordance with the position, the provisions of the design standard for Scarborough's commercial districts with the following waiver below. Waivers. Due to the unique use of the structure as a climbing gym and the overall contemporary building design, the board waives the use and size standards for applying the alternative design provisions set forth in the office building subsection of the design standards. Conditions. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide a revised traffic, traffic impact fee assessment report for review and approval by staff, pay peer review fees, provide a copy of the DOT permit for the town's record, provide a revised plan set, including modifications to address the utility cut and enhanced landscaping through the Hygis Parkway <coughs> buffer strip. The applicant shall execute the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater infrastructure maintenance ordinance. That applicant work with the planning board on a pedestrian connection to the... To the remainder of the Scammon property when, when it's, it's further, further developed. <coughs> Thank you. Prior to the issuance of a certificate of compliance, the applicant shall submit evidence in the form of a letter or plan prepared and stamped by a professional engineer who will, e 
either prepare the post-construction stormwater management plan and its associated facilities, or supervise the plan and facilities construction and implementation. The letter of plan shall certify that the stormwater <coughs> facilities have been installed in accordance with the approved post-construction stormwater management plan and that they will function as intended by said plan. An additional, any additional plantings for the wall mesh shall be included on the landscaping plan. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have a second? Comments? Just one quick clarification. Uh, during your reading, the I guess it would be on a condition F um, regarding the sidewalks. I believe you said it was the the applicant would have to work with the planning board on future developments. Did you mean to say planning staff? I wrote planning board because the Scammon property would likely go through planning board review. Uh, presumably, a similar project, uh, a subdivision, uh, an office building would come into the board because it's zoned commercially. Um, so I wrote planning board because you'd likely be looking at the remainder of the property and you could consider how it's connected. Um, I guess my question would be more or less for this specific applicant to connect to the other properties. Would it be wise use of their time and our time to actually meet in front of the full planning board or rather staff. work with staff to connect to what the planning board will approve on future developments? Yeah, I wouldn't want to suggest that they're coming in with their engineers and, and having a review process like this. So um, it could also be planning staff. I, I, it was more of a timing issue. Mm -hmm. The planning board review period of the remainder of the parcel would be when we need to figure out the connection. Um, so it can be changed to planning department. That's that's fine. My preference would be planning yeah. department. The other potential is that, that wording wise, that the other potential is that something minor like this could potentially be addressed as an administrative change mm -hmm. by whoever's chair at that time. Mm -hmm. So. In essence, that would still be an action taken by the board <coughs> through the chair, administratively. So, however the board decides that they would like to proceed, it's fine. But if there's a general statement to, <coughs> I mean, in general, yes, my my only my only concern would be forcing them to come back here to put in 15 feet of sidewalks. That you know, whether it's a good use of their time and ours. Could that decision okay. be made by staff. That decision, I don't see a reason why. Sure. I think staff. I would be comfortable doing that. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody uncomfortable with staff doing that? Absolutely not. Then um, I would amend my motion to say planning staff as opposed to planning board. Great. Does the second still hold? Yes. Okay. okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? And I show that to be unanimous. Thank you for your time. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys. What's that? Our next item this evening, Anthony Vale Way Subdivision. Norman Barubi Builders requests a preliminary subdivision review for three single lots on Sarah Liberty Lane. Mr. Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the board reviewed this project last at a sketch plan a few months ago. Uh, at that meeting, there were some questions about exactly how this proposal fit into Hamrack Place, which is the adjacent subdivision. Um, since then, the applicants tried to clarify those questions in your, in your package, in their submission. Um, provided to you, you should have some staff comments in a memo, um, also a memo from Jim Wendell, our town engineer. Peter Tubbs of SYT Design, also reviewing engineering, and from Bill Bray, who's um, viewed the project in terms of the traffic generation out of it as it relates to the town's impact fee um, zones. We've also gotten three different emails from abutters, uh, primarily with concerns about the existing groundwater in the area, um, high water table that exists in the area and another uh, email about um, 
sort of the history of the project again as it relates to, to Tamarack Place that was approved in um, early 2000s. Like we've heard from abutters, some of our staff comments do focus around concerns over the, the water table level in this area um, and that there's some surface water that occurs from time to time over an annual year, a calendar year. And um, it's a bit unique in that the water table feature doesn't actually classify as wetlands necessarily. Um, typically in our net residential density calculations, wetlands are deducted and that's what the board focuses on in large part. This is uh, kind of a circumstance where there's a high water table but it's sandier soils and they're not wetlands present. Um, but it seems to be a challenge for abutting property owners and so staff recommends that a lot of thought be given to this particular issue um, and maybe some consideration about getting some guidance from maybe a hydrologist or a professional that can provide some guidance on this to better understand uh, what's occurring out there. It's also been a problem for public works um, as it relates to the town's road system and culverts in the vicinity. And they've done a fair amount of work with some of the abutters on helping relieve some of the, um, the surface water challenges out there along Holmes Road and Sarah Liberty. Um, other than that, uh, we do have some comments too about the, the road design, the way it's laid out. Um, the hammerhead doesn't meet the town design standard. It's on the, the turnarounds on the other side. Um, and the, it's a fair amount of road infrastructure for three lots um, coming off of a cul-de-sac. So um, Public Works has reviewed it and, and isn't recommending it be a public road, um, particularly the way it's designed. Um, it may be better suited for a private road with private maintenance um, given the circumstances. Uh, I think the other, only other comment I think is worthy of noting before I turn it back to Mr. Uh, the Chair is there is a waiver request on conducting a nitrate plume analysis for the project. Um, I think the request is such because of the size of the overall parcel um, that the lots are fairly small um, to be served by well and septic. Uh, so I think the board should discuss whether we want to waive the nitrate plume analysis that looks at you know, um, the, the septic leach areas and, and how much space is provided there for both those and uh, well zones on individual lots and they're about 30,000 square feet so that it's getting close to being tight so um, it might be worth still conducting that analysis but that's something the board should weigh in on. So with that I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, Bill. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. Bill Thompson with BH2M Engineers, here for Norman Ruby Builders for the three-lot Anthony Vale Way subdivision that's depicted on the, uh, on the plan here. As Dan indicated, we were back here in November. We had a conventional plan uh, that we presented uh, with the 80,000 square foot lot, which would be in this RF <coughs> zone. But being an RF zone, <coughs> conservation subdivision is required. We have 22.7 acres for the three lots. Uh, each lot will be 30,000 square foot or greater. The frontage is uh, 150 or greater. Uh, a couple of the lots tend to be uh, closer to 200 uh, feet of frontage. Uh, this area of town, uh, drilled wells are required. Uh, there's no public water. And also um, on-site subsurface disposal systems. We have conducted uh, the soil tests out here to support those. And the uh, groundwater evidence was anywhere from 15 to 18 inches uh, below the surface. And our logs are all part of the submission that we brought into the town. Uh, we have fire protection out at the Holmes Road at Sarah Liberty Lane. And of course, this road comes in off Sarah Liberty Lane. There is a fire tank out there, and we're uh, waiting for the fire chief to respond. But our indication is the distance for these three lots uh, could be served by that uh, facility that's in place. Um, as with all projects, we'll have underground electric. Our roadway, proposed roadway coming in off Sarah Liberty is 740 feet. Uh, the first 350 feet of road, we will have curbing. Uh, 21 foot wide road with curb. Uh, that way we can control any of the uh, surface water uh, on that roadway. The road will be crowned. 
when the water gets to the curb, it'll travel down the road in a southwesterly direction. And at 350 feet or 340 feet, I'll stop the curb and go into ditches. And I'll run the ditches down to the end of the road through a level spreader and then dissipate out into the wetland, which is about a 14 acre wetland. Um, the uh, open space area, of course, is, is designated or delineated there. We do not propose any, any activity other than just to provide that, that open space. As Dan indicated, uh, peer review has been conducted. Uh, Peter Tubbs uh, has looked at it. We've responded back uh, through his memos. And also Jim Wendell, both uh, at this point are supporting a preliminary approval, or at least we're at a preliminary point for consideration. Uh, Dan indicated also um, requesting a nitrate study. Um, <coughs> we have has requested uh, to locate the wells and septics on the abutting properties to see if there would be any impact from anything that we're proposing. Our septic locations are here. There's nothing closer than 150 to 200 feet from the boundaries. And we, we feel, again, that, that uh, a uh, waiver of the nitrate study would not, not be uh, out, of, out of line. This property, um, as you know, uh, the, the neighbors uh, have, have voiced some concerns. I've seen some ponding out here. I've had photos uh, submitted, uh, and I think some, some documents have been submitted to the town for our review. Uh, back in 2001, there was a groundwater elevation study done uh, for Mr. Grondon, who owned the land at that time. And the findings at that time indicated what we've found is that the groundwater evidence is anywhere from 15 to 18 inches below ground. And the subsurface water tends to duplicate uh, at grade elevations, if you will. The groundwater, ever so slightly, is going in a south-southeasterly direction into this wetland, which was the findings back in 2001. So what I've tried to accomplish here <coughs> tried to do is, is not impact any of the properties to the south, or to the north rather, off the Holmes Road. So I've kept the road as far off of the common boundary line as we could, curbed the roadway, so any water, and I've raised the road. As you can see here, I've, I've got three feet of fill under this end of the road and then the two feet of uh, roadway gravel. Can you stand on the other side of your chair? Sure. I don't then want to block then you can't hear the, the, does the mic. Then I can't reach the mic. Oh, <laughs> Well, can the camera get it if I move the easel? Okay. It'd be nice for us to be able to see it. Well, I'm not sure where the best spot is going to be. Does the microphone come up? Let me try that. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, um, what I've tried to do here is, you know, this land is very flat. There's very little grade across here. Uh, the neighbors are experiencing problems with uh, surface water. When Sarah Liberty Lane was built, uh, there are no ditches on that road. It's crowned and goes off into wooded buffers, which in theory works. Uh, DEP approved it apparently uh, for that stormwater design. So the, the land is very flat uh, in this 22 acres. So what I've done is I've lifted the road up at the entrance and I've forced all my stormwater down to the end and I've got a level spreader at the end which fills with the stormwater, kind of like a collection spot, and then it goes out in a, just as it indicates, a level spreader, and it all goes off into the south, southeasterly, into this wetland. So by putting a curb on both sides of this road, none of my road water is going to go off and impact any. And I've got an open space area here that'll be left in its natural state, no cutting, no clearing. That'll help um, alleviate any, any uh, uh, groundwater and, and help certainly help the, uh, the abutting property. So the water, again, it'll be crowned, it'll come down, and when I get to this point in the roadway, I then I'm going to have open ditches coming down both sides around my T-turnaround and into this level spreader. The lots, I'm going to fill the lots, probably three feet of fill, create a, a drainage divide here so all the water from, from the, uh, probably the center of the roof of the houses, all the water will come forward, same with this lot here, because this is less of an, a concern with the neighbors being being on the other side of the road. So again, we've we've looked at the at the 
at the issues. I've seen the photos. So we're trying to, I guess, be good neighbors. We've only got three lots in here. And the other, uh, the other thing that was requested, uh, probably Jim Wendell, uh, for the town engineer, is I've got some cross-hatched areas around these lots. What Jim would like us to do is after we fill these to, to accomplish the grading that we need to bring it forward, is to leave these areas um, in a natural state. Let them grow in. You know, we'll, we'll loam and seed them to stabilize them, but let natural vegetation grow in all these areas. Again, will help keep you know, the, uh, the clearing limits down and help create a, a, just another, another buffer between, between the properties and, uh, and help again just to keep this, try to put it back into more of a natural, natural condition. So we've looked at it. Um, we've tried to, again, pull everything to the south, southeast. The groundwater study that was done in 2001 indicates a very slight travel of groundwater in this direction. So again, if we, we feel that with the three lot design here, uh, the impact to uh, anybody to the north, northwest of us uh, is not going to be aggravated by, by this development. So um, the waiver again, we, we hope that, that that could be considered. This is a small project. Uh, Dan indicated uh, Public Works and I think Jim Wendell also um, is suggesting that this road uh, s remain as a private road. Um, we would like to have it considered as a public road. Um, obviously, it will be built with the gravel depths, uh, curbing. Um, I realize the T-turnaround, if, if it should be on the other side, it would impact this lot. And I think um, Jim Wendell indicated a little bit longer pavement on that too to uh, meet all the uh, public safety requirements. So that certainly could be accomplished, um, but I'll, I'll defer to the board on that. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. As is our process, before I turn this open, uh, over to the board, I will <coughs> allow for public comment. Um, I would also like to indicate for the record purposes, Mr. Bacon alluded to the fact that we had received some emails from folks uh, regarding this project. We have a November 18th um, email from Kimberly Lehman. We have a February 23rd email from Andrea Corbett. We also have a February 17th email from uh, a Josh Suleman. So I uh, just wanted to make sure that we got that information in. All the board members received copy of these of these emails, and I'm trusting that they had an opportunity or took an opportunity to review them um, prior to this point from our meeting. Um, very, very similar to our public hearing, we would ask that anybody who wanted to speak this evening and make a public comment, please approach the mic, state your name and address for the record. We ask you to try to limit your <coughs> comments to five minutes or less. And uh, we also ask um, that, uh, if at all possible, try to limit your comments to something somebody else hasn't already spoken about. So with that, I will open this up to public comment. If anybody would like to speak, please feel free to do so. Great. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Well, I haven't sent an email. My, uh, my name is Robert Coppola. I'm the uh, owner of 11 Sarah Liberty, and I'm kind of new to what's been going on here. Um, sort of sounds like to me, just preliminary, that their intent is to build these new homes up. Um, water seeks its own level. I'm the guy at the end. I'm going to be at the low end of the, of the uh, totem pole here. So that's a little concern that, that I have, because I already have water problems. Um, you know, on a good rainstorm, I have two pumps running, both directions. Um, you know, it sounds good that the water can get out to the wetlands. Um, I've walked it. It isn't like it's much, much lower than my property. So I'm not really sure, uh, you know, the details just yet of where all this water is going to go. Um, you know, his, his idea of coming in off of Sarah Liberty 
with uh, curbing to act like a gutter uh, and, and to start the water in the right direction, but it seems like it, it comes up short, which would be my backyard. So I have a little concern. I'd have to study that a little bit more. To, uh, if, it, it's, if it's gonna come in and just dump in my backyard, I'm gonna be dealing with it. There's, there's no doubt about it, because it already floods back there. Um, so, uh, you know, when you put a road in, you kind of seal off the surface. My understanding is uh, you create a big gutter. So I do have a concern that, that I will be dealing with more water. And uh, obviously they know there's a problem. That's why he wants to build them up. It sounds like he wants to build them up three feet, uh, which I wish my house was up three feet. And I wish the road was down two feet like it originally was planned, and, and I'm getting stories from my neighbors that uh, a rid, the original, <clears throat> excuse me, the original engineering, uh, Sarah Liberty had the uh, the roundabout, the the, the uh, cul-de-sac, two feet lower, and John Grondon, who who built my home, his engineering was based around that road being two feet lower, so. You know, I, I kind of get the feeling that, you know, at some point, if things continue, I'm going to be down here, and everybody else is going to be up here. And, you know, this is a little bit after the fact here that some, some things have changed. Uh, and, and the other thing to take into consideration that the, my understanding is that, you know, weather's getting more and more dramatic. You know, we don't get two inches of rain. We get five inches of rain. We get seven inches of rain when it rains. Um, so, I mean, the resale, I, got, I have to look at the resale. Uh, I have to look at uh, how many pumps I want to put in my basement to, uh, you know, to try to deal with it. Um, I, I, and again, my concern is if these wetlands really can't handle the volume it's going to back up. If it's got no place to go, it's going to back up. So that's, uh, that's my concern tonight. Mr. Coppola, uh, just for clarification right here. Oh, um, it's you, weird echo. The house that you own was the one that John Grondon built? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coble. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marlies Montgomery, and I own the property at 318 Holmes Road. And I learned about this more recently, maybe five or six weeks ago, from my neighbor, Josh Suleiman, who I understand you have some documentation from. Um, who kind of brought me up to speed as to what was going on. I understand also, and I want to just point out for the record, there was a letter, I think, that went out from the town <coughs> um, to all the abutters, and I never received that letter, so I'm not sure what happened with that. But um, I want to express the same concerns about the water. Um, for anybody that's familiar with uh, the properties on Holmes Road, um, 316 and 318 have had an ongoing issue with major puddling. Um, and the culvert was installed a year or two ago. Um, the jury's still out on whether or not that's alleviated that problem, but um, I, too, have some pumps in my basement, um, and the water table is um, very high, and so it doesn't take a lot of rain for it to be an issue um, for us. Um, and it's constantly, constantly um, something that we're having to address and deal with. I think that with the plan, um, as it's designed, the uh, lots that abut um, my property and Josh's property, um, again, with having to build that up, you know, that to me, while some of the road water is going to come this way and into the wetlands, there's going to be also water that's going to go on the back side of that um, and just add to what is already a water issue for us um, on Holmes Road. So definitely a huge concern. Um, I think the second thing that I just want to mention is that, you know, for us who seek um, land and property sort of on the outskirts of the town, we do that for a reason because we want 
that extra acreage. We want that privacy. And, you know, if I wanted to live really close to a neighbor, I probably would have chosen a different area of the town to build my house on. Um, but I like having two acres, and I like having the buffer and the privacy. And um, there's not going to be a lot of privacy in my backyard um, going forward. And so, um, you know, I just want to express that, um, that, you know, that's one of the major reasons why I chose that property to begin with. I've been there for 11 years, and I've been very happy with the exception of, of the water issue. Um, but now knowing that, you know, somebody's right in my backyard whom I don't know yet, and who could bring um, who knows what <laughs> to my property. Um, it's, a li it's definitely concerning. So um, I just wanted to uh, make that statement tonight. Thank you, Ms. Montgomery. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Bradley. I and my family live at 4 Sierra Liberty Lane. Um, I won't bring up the water because everyone does, and we all love it. Um, <laughs> But I wasn't sure that the board was aware of. There are a couple things that, while we are all talk, talking amongst ourselves in the street, um, we all have deed restrictions and covenants on our land, which are part and parcel with this property that's located here. Um, one of them are size restrictions minimums for the structures that need to be built. I believe it's 1,800 square feet and 1,400 square feet. Not absolutely sure. Um, there are some other conditions require a single driveway for each house. Um, requires requirements about fencing and outbuildings. Also the types of construction, nothing modular. Uh, certain slopes are required. I wasn't sure that anyone had made the board aware yet of these restrictions. Um, but one restriction in particular that I think fits into what Marlise was saying uh, was sort of the quality and character of our neighborhood. Um, I know smart growth requires that undeveloped lands become developed, um, but it's smart to grow them in a way that's um, dependable and predictable so that high density growth happens where there's high density, where there are things like sidewalks, access to things, public spaces requires high density. Uh, we are in a rural farmland area. Um, like Marley said, we expect a certain amount of porosity in our, li our lives. Um, and to that point, if this road can't be a road, um, one would view it as a driveway. Um, if it's not a public road, I would expect that the Postal Service wouldn't drive down this road to deliver mail. Um, I would expect that the garbage collection would not go down this road to collect garbage cans. It's one of the covenants on this property is that the garbage cans aren't displayed they aren't left down at the end of some common driveway. So that would require these landowners, potential landowners, to uh, go 750 feet with their 64 gallon, 200 pound capacity garbage cans, which might happen for a few months. But when all is said and done, those things are going to live on our street, which is against the bylaws of our land. Um, it would also probably be expected that there would be a ganged series of mailboxes at the end of this private way. So more and more to me, it sounds like a single drive with three homes, which is more the character of a multifamily. Um, so I think this is a subdivision within our subdivision that doesn't meet the same character and quality of what we are all purchased into. And it brings up a very fundamental caution for us. This is the primary investment of most of us. Um, if the character of this neighborhood changes to a smaller home on a smaller lot and reduces the value of those lots, it will in turn affect the value of our lots. So while I may not enjoy the idea of losing open space, I might enjoy the, the addition of neighbors, but I would definitely have a special, uh, a special personal and financial consequence if these homes are developed in a way that reduces the nature of our neighborhood. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. 
Hi, my name is Corey Fravert. I live on 1 uh, Sarah Liberty Lane. And just a few points to add about the uh, water drainage. Many of you probably know this, but Woodfield, which run in, runs in behind us, is a much higher elevation than where we are in Sarah Liberty. So all of their water off, drains off the back of their hill down into this wetland. So this, this area saturates pretty quickly. Um, after about an hour of rain, I need to be heading home and checking my basement to make sure that I don't have a problem that I need to spend the rest of the day with. Um, and the way that it flows now, once those um, wetlands are saturated is it moves and I think you've seen this from Josh's pictures it moves this way um, towards um, Holmes Road um, and tries to access Bond Brook which then takes it down um, into um, below us down into the you know wetlands and the pond that's down there off a of broad turn so really about after about an hour um, you start to see the, the water turn and head um, behind um, our lots um, Kim and I'm here um, Kim and um, my lot and then uh, between Josh and I and try to work its way to that ditch uh, and then move down uh, to Bond Brook. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty striking, uh, um, the water, um, surface water situation because the water table is so high and uh, 15 inches sounds deep to me. I could dig, you know, a whole a couple shovelfuls and I'd have water, you know, filled up, you know, in the back of my yard. So um, I'd question whether or not uh, um, that depth is true um, as you get closer uh, to Holmes Road. Um, and then it's also under, our understanding that the board has to grant an exception for um, this type of arrangement to occur uh, in this area. And we have a number of subdivisions around us, Woodfields, Sterling Wood, uh, Golden Wood, uh, Mur Murrow Brook, Spring Brook, Fengler, uh, Timber Sands, Carter Brook. None of those divisions have something that looks like this um, off of them. Um, they're all nice, big, you know, two acre lots, uh, big homes, no private ways. Um, so this would be really an exception to everything else that you see um, out where we are uh, if it was built um, as it's designed. And when we bought the house, we knew that that lot was there and that there was a chance that someday, you know, something would go in there. But this isn't really what any of us, I think, um, expected uh, when we uh, um, decided to uh, move into Sarah Li uh, Liberty Lane. Um, and then it was also mentioned um, the piece about the title and there is some still some questions about um, why certain properties or certain parcels within this um, were held to certain covenants and it seems like this um, piece or this subdivision um, is it, it it still doesn't seem clear um, to us and and those are questions that we'd um, be curious to hear more about as to why the board would actually grant uh, an exception uh, to this uh, uh, development um, the other thing is we we weren't able to find any DE per, e permits on file um, here uh, at the uh, office. Um, so even for our Tamarack Place or some of the original um, subdivisions, there was no there were no DE permits and DEP permits in the record. Um, so that was uh, a little bit curious, um, and would um, be interested to see um, how that uh, is resolved. Um, and then also the stormwater analysis. You know, obviously in the spring, um, that's when it's um, at its worst. Um, and it would be great to see um, some analysis done um, during that time uh, of year. And we built an in-law apartment off of our house um, for my mother-in-law. And when we put in our septic design, uh, we had to build all of our septics above um, grade. So we could not disturb any of the ground. Um, everything had to be built up um, above that. Um, so if that is true um, for these pieces, that, of course, is going to further impact um, you know, water on drainage and where, you know, where uh, it's all going to go. And then the well exception areas, we spent quite a bit of time making sure that we were, um, you know, uh, within or, or, you know, not um, uh, doing anything within that well exception area. And we had to actually move um, some of our original design uh, to stay outside of that area uh, on our piece of property. And I didn't see that on any of the um, maps um, yet that we've looked at for this uh, subdivision. So I'd be curious as to what those would look like in that space. And it does seem a little uh, counterintuitive to me, and this is just a layperson, that um, you're building next to a wetland, so an exception is granted so that you can actually build more houses um, next to a, a wetland. That just, it might make sense in an urban area where you're compressed for space and you don't have a lot of room to do things, but in a space like this where we're all out, you know, in the woods, you know, for a reason, to grant that kind of exception in an area um, like this just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to make sense, um, uh, at least um, on paper. Um, so that was all that I had. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Corey, would you be so kind is to help us with your last name. Yeah. Frey Vert. Okay. Frey Vert. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm uh, Pat O'Brien. I live on 24 Woodfield Drive. So uh, I'm, uh, my house is part of uh, Woodfield Estates that uh, uh, kind of abuts behind Sarah Liberty Lane. Actually, my property abuts uh, Mr. Coppola's. Um, so I have generally the same concern he has. Um, you know, the, the concern that, that Mr. Thompson addressed, which um, is the, the water concern on kind of the north northwest side, um, I'm concerned with all of that uh, groundwater coming down to the south and southeast side. Um, the wetlands that are there right now do get very flooded, um, not just towards towards my property, but towards a lot of the um, you know the properties along Woodfield Drive. Um, so I'm concerned that if all of that water gets pushed to the south and southeast, you know we're going to be dealing with a lot of the same issues um, that it seems like Sarah Liberty Lane is is already dealing with. Um, there are houses on the other side of of uh, Woodfield Drive that are high. Um, my property, which is is here in the bottom corner, uh, tends to be one of the lower properties. So as it, if you come in from um, from Broad Turn, you know there's there's a bit of a kind of a flat entry, and then it starts to climb. So I'm kind of at that base, um, and I'm expecting that if this um, proposal goes forward, we will see a lot of of groundwater come our way. Um, so I won't continue that any, any further. But I, I guess one question I did have is, um, it sounded like there was a groundwater study done in 2001, I think, mentioned. Um, and I don't know if there's requirements to do additional groundwater studies with some frequency, either wetland or groundwater studies, when, when new subdivisions are going in. Um, you know, 2001 seems like quite a long time ago. Uh, I don't know if there are requirements for that, but if maybe the, the board could address that. Um, I did also notice that lot one is less than 30,000 square feet. I know it mentions that all lots are um, a minimum of 30,000 square feet, but it's actually under 30,000 square feet, at least on these plans. It's 29,000 and some change. Um, I'm sure that would, would get potentially addressed, but I just wanted to point that out as well. Um, all right, I think that's all the questions I had. Comments, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is that when I purchased this property, I was told by Matthew Chamberlain, who uh, was the broker, and also John Grondon, that the intent for the land behind me was for a brand new home for John Grondon and his family. That's what I was told. And they, I mean, I should have got it in writing. Obviously, if it, you know, if it isn't in writing, it doesn't exist. But um, th so this is a little bit uh, of a shock that, that we're now dealing with a, with a small subdivision. I'm in real estate, too. I'm not against real estate. Uh, everybody needs a place to live. And it's just uh, th this kind of caught me by surprise, to be quite honest with you. Um, and it's a problem. I, everybody in the street complains about the water, and we just want to make sure that uh, <coughs> I had I got involved with a piece of real estate down in Massachusetts, and you know this this is not new to me. Uh, when you're talking four hundred thousand dollar house lots down in Massachusetts, I backed out of a deal because of water problems. The neighbor would not cooperate. Uh, my people told me that there had to be drainage there. No one listened. They built the house. They all ended up in court. And the poor guy that ended up with that house, he's absolutely disgusted. You know, $1.5 million home, and he gets two feet of water in his basement. And he's tried everything. So, I mean, I, I feel for everybody with their water problems, and I'm dealing with it myself. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing, too, is when the power goes out, we don't have pumps. So that's another issue. You know, unless you want to spend, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 for an uh, automated backup system, uh, you know, that's great, but that's, that's another issue. No power, no pumps. So... But uh, that, that was the story when I purchased my property, that uh, it would never get developed, that John Grund was going to. Uh, 
I have another question for you. Why did, right here, right here. Oh, I don't know. For some reason, it sounds like it's coming from over there. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm talking this way. <laughs> uh, why did Mr. Grondin keep that other parcel? Was he planning to do something there eventually? To build his that's, home on. Oh, that's where, okay. Yes. That, that's <clears throat> what he told me, and that was the story. And what he told us was he envisioned all of his family having homes back there on his property. Is that land high and dry? It's, it's, uh, or, I've walked it a little bit. Or is um, it similar to yours? Yes. It is. I, I don't, I don't see that it's, if it's lower, it's lower by a couple of inches. Yeah. I mean, I, I sit in my backyard and I look out at it, and I think uh, he had said it's pretty much all the same level. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Right. If we're going to have people talking, they really need to be at the podium. I'm sorry. So, I mean, no, I just, okay. I you know, just, if you spilled 55 gallons of water in this room, the whole room would be flooded, providing the floor is level. Yeah. So, whether, you know, uh, that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. I don't think the water really has much. And, and after a good rainstorm, I mean, you could be looking at a week to 10 days before, before the water, you know, wherever it does go, it must, you know, percolate into the ground. Um, you know, as, as Andy's told me, basically all we do is pump water around in circles until it finally decides to go away. So, I mean, it, there's no place for it to go. Maybe okay. we could get a big pipe out to the ocean. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> anyone else? I think Rob raises a, raises a good point. Uh, I'm Dan Dwyer from uh, 6 Sarah Liberty Lane, and I do have an automatic generation system at my house. Uh, we moved here from Wisconsin, and we live just outside of Kohler, Wisconsin, so we have a very nice whole house Kohler generator, uh, as do the laymans across the street. And as far as I know, every single house on our street does have at least a generator backup of some kind. I believe the laymans and we are the only two that have automatic systems. So basically, when we lose power within three seconds, I'm back online, and I can run for 11 days. Um, and I must admit, my sump pump runs a lot, but I've never had water down the basement, thank God. Um, the other thing which I object to, I guess, is the contention that water flow is this direction. Um, the people on Holmes Road have told me that they've seen water going in their direction. So it must be going everywhere. It's going both down to Woodfield, and it's also going out to Holmes Road. So that is a major wetland of some sort. Uh, the fact that the uh, water table by the Ruby engineers is 15 to 18 inches, that doesn't give me any confidence at all. How they're getting perk tests out of that, I would love to see the data for that. It just absolutely blows my mind. Uh, one time we bought property in New Hampshire, and you could go down, you know, four or five feet and not get any water. Uh, and even then we had questionable perk tests. And here at 18 inches, they're going to get a perk test, or they're going to put a mound system in. I would think they're probably going to put a mound system in. And I don't know if that's allowed under our rules or our subdivision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dwyer. Anybody else okay. We do appreciate your comments. Um, certainly we'll be addressing uh, some of these, or hopefully as many as possible, with the applicant. One that I would like to clean up right out of the gate. I mean, obviously, the water is the water. We've got to, we're going to be discussing that um, with the applicant. But I do want to make one clarifying point is that there are no waivers being requested or being granted by this board in terms of um, this subdevelopment. So this is a conservation subdevelopment, and it was actually designed that whole conservation subdevelopment, part of the purpose for it being designed as it was, is to try to keep two things. Number one, to try to be able to build more on, um, on areas where there were some wetlands, to be able to cluster houses a little bit closer, um, to allow for that, which also at the same time protects open space um, in portions of, um, of our town 
with the intent that it eliminates some of the sprawl that actually is occurring by just divvying up an 80 uh, square foot parcel, 80,000 square foot parcels or whatever it might be. So uh, this actually is subdivision does not require a waiver and it's the type of development that we actually encourage. So for, what, for whatever that's worth, I'll point it out. If I did not describe that properly, then <laughs> please help me. But. I think okay. rather than having the smaller lots um, prior to the conservation subdivision design, there could be three lots covering the 22 acres. You know, they'd be larger lots with much of the land being um, the wetlands that you see now being in open space. So the project is not allowed to have more lots. It's the size of the lots that are allowed. And then in exchange for smaller lots, there's a requirement to leave the wetlands in common open space so they're not owned by individual property owners and filled gradually over time, that kind of thing. So um, according to the calculation on the overall land area, there can be three lots on the property. It's whether they're large lots or small, it's, it's really just a scale of how big the lots are allowed to be. It helps. Okay. So thank you. Um, I'm sorry? When you say no waivers, does that include exceptions? Are there any exceptions being granted, or are they one and the same? Not at this point. No, no a waiver is a physical waiver. There, was, there, there were a couple references to a, a request for a waiver of the nitrate fume, flume analysis, right. and that may have contributed to that right. perception. Right. It may have been There's not a... Yeah, yeah. No, we have not granted that yet. Right. So... And there's not an exception or a waiver being requested on the number of lots or the sizes of the lots. There are the two waivers being requested, one being the nitrate analysis that um, the applicant presented. <coughs> okay. Thank you for the clarification. I would need you to go to the mic. Sure. Can you explain what, what, what you mean by your name, name please? Oh, sorry, Rob Travis. I live at 8 Sarah Liberty. Um, I was just wondering, when you say open space, who owns that open space? Do, do the three people have to create an association and they own the open space? And Typically, it's either the three lot owners um, would have an association to own the open space, or they can just own it in common without having an actual homeowners association. They all own a third of the land. It's not allowed to be really used for anything but for walking your dog in the woods or whatever you might do on in the wooded area um, or you know go thank you I, w I just wasn't clear what that meant sure. thank you all right I'll turn it over to the board <coughs> John you're looking good I'm not ready yet all right <laughs> Susan mostly procedural at this point what is our procedure at this point well my qu I have, it's really more of a question I think is that all of the points that have been brought up here tonight, most of the points that have been brought up here tonight, deal with wetland impacts, it seems. And I'm not sure that, other than saying we're concerned too, that we can do much about it sitting here this evening. So I don't know what is it that we do do. I mean, we just, my thing would be to say, I agree. It looks like there's a problem. There's some inconsistencies in what we've been told and what other people have been told, but this is a this is a wetland issue. <laughs> so what can we do? What do so we do now? What I would suggest that you do mm -hmm. when you have an opportunity or if you'd like to take it at this point is we start to ask the applicant questions in, re in regards to how's, how's the drainage and stormwater being addressed, how's the issues that, that have been brought up by the members of the public, okay. are they being addressed? I certainly have a couple of questions yeah. uh, in that regard. Okay. Also in regard to, you know, some of the covenants, how do we, how do we get to the bottom of what, are, you know, are there covenants on this property that might impact mm -hmm. the design that we've laid out? That okay. is a possibility, so. Gotcha. Um, well, I don't have many, so I'll start. 
All right. the applicant. Welcome back. All right. Okay, so one of the first things that, that, just a statement to begin with, this is a major wetland. It's a big problem we have in Scarborough. We have a lot of wetlands in Scarborough, and they're all tricky. So I just want everybody here to know that we care. Um, taking care of wetlands in this town is a BFD, and um, we do the best we can. It may take us a while, so we're not appreciative of the issues. The first thing I'm a little confused about is which way the water is running. Is it running in both? I'm not, I'm not asking you to give me an answer, but if you want to, that's fine. It's coming this way, and it's going that way. Where does the line of demarcation occur? I mean, if it's going into um, Holmes Road, and it's also going to come down. It, we know it's coming into the wetland. It has to. we got a wetland. Correct. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be going that way, but it's also going the other way. So do you happen to know where that demarcation line occurs? I do not know what's happening uh, northwesterly of this property. But you're sure that the, the ones that we're talking about are all going to flow south? Based on the study in 2001, seven monitoring wells were put in there. Seven. In 2001? 2001. 2001 okay, so that leads me to what would be my first concern. Is it because of the nature of this, whether a 2001 study is recent enough? I mean, we are going to be adding more load, if you will, to the soil. And how is Go ahead, Dan. You can go. Well, was the study done in anticipation of Tamarack Place, or was it another purpose for the study? Because um, I'm not aware of the details of the study. So I think it's important to know whether its study was done pre-development in the area or post. It was, it, again, the study was done in April of 2001 for Mr. Grondon. So I don't know what existed out there in 2001. Is that prior to Tamarack Place? <coughs> I believe. I believe Tamarack Place was 2006 or seven. I don't have those plans yet. I think it's earlier than that. 2003. Okay, so I'd like to put that as one of my concerns. Something I think it's a clarification. It's a clarification like issue. I'm not sure really what whether or not the 2001 study is as recent as it needs to be. If it was pre the. Tamarack Lane is a very different thing, and if it was post in my... I think it, there's implications for yeah. significant amount more development and how that relates to the ground, to the water table and the right. conveyance of water in the area, certainly. Right. Okay, so that's one of my big concerns. Um, oh, where was... <laughs> I just wrote all over the place here. Um, I got the confusion of which way it flows. These houses will have basements, I assume. I believe I'm recommending no basements. No basements. On the, plan. <coughs> okay. the curbing that's going to be on the on the road, the, the mm -hmm. entrance road, private road. Yes. If if it does not get accepted by the town, the, the applicant would like it to be a town road, but it would like it to be a town be. road. Yeah. Okay. Because somebody was talking about if it's a private road, there's the issue of mailboxes and all that a stuff. Private road wouldn't be our choice. No, but, yeah, I but I'm just saying, um, just know that if it's a private road, there are ways that that's all taken care of. Uh, but if it, either way, what is the curving going to be made of? It'll be concrete, cast in place concrete. That's a good sign. Okay. Um, I'm a little confused about the fact that the buffers, that the um, Buffers as shown on this plan are not consistent. Some are 30, some are 35, some are 40 feet. Yeah, we tried to get a a, a regular window, building window, if you will, mm -hmm. and and minimize the clearing to a 40 percent of the lot size. So, yeah, they they do vary, but there was no rhyme or reason. We just wanted to get as much of the perimeter in in natural conditions, if we as we could, and keep it within 30,000 feet. It is. It has been pointed out that lot one is not thirty thousand feet. Yeah. It's twenty nine six thirty two. This plan and some change. This is thirty thousand. It's thirty thousand thirty three. I believe an earlier version okay. there was a math error, right. but it has been corrected. All right. Thank you. Sure. All right. The the the, the concern about what's going to happen uh, with wetland impact of the additional um, building. I just had to make a comment that has nothing to do, except that people have mentioned Mr. Grandin. <sighs> Unfortunately, this happens too often in my book. Who said if you ain't got it written down, it doesn't exist? 
I mean, that's really what it is. We, oh, we have nothing that we can do or say or, or take into consideration because of that. But I have had things happen to me that I understand that it's very disconcerting. It, it's, it's very disappointing, but this board can't do anything about that. Thank you. That's all I'm going to do for tonight. <coughs> Thank you, Susan. Nick? Could you circle back to me? I'm still processing okay. some of this. Dave? I'll give it a try. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of uh, concerns here tonight, and, and I think they're very legitimate. Um, that would be my biggest concern, would be the water issues. Uh, I would like some answers. Your, your wife, uh, Mrs. Fravert, posed a lot of good questions. Uh, and I'd like some of those questions answered regarding the restrictions and covenants as to whether or not those restrictions, covenants for uh, Sarah Liberty Lane also apply to this property here. Uh, and if so, how does that impact uh, this subdivision going forward? Um, and the other, another issue, um, uh, Mr. Thompson, you mentioned that uh, based on the study back in, what, 2001, the, the, the natural flow is towards the south? South, southeast. Yeah. Uh, but my question is, where is it going to flow once the subdivision is completed and the houses are built? Because these houses are going to have to be built up. Mm -hmm. uh, the septic systems will have to be built up. And when the rain falls and and the watershed comes off the roofs and, and those mounds that the houses are sitting on, you know, my, <clears throat> my guess is that water's gonna flow in all directions, including towards the north. Uh, so that, you know, that's a concern of mine. Um, I just, I, you know, I just, I, you know, for the record, when Mr. Grande built his house, I was working for the town of Scarborough. I was, I was the assistant assessor. And I, I did have to go out and inspect that house, you know, for assessing purposes. And it seems to me um, <clears throat> the information I got was that the reason, I think it, at that time his lot was 40 acres or something. Yeah. Um, and the reason was because of the wetlands. Uh, so here we are now, uh, 10, 15 years later, and um, we have a subdivision proposal, and we still have the wetlands issue. So that's, that's a big concern for me, and I just <clears throat> think uh, a lot of questions need to be answered before I'm convinced. Okay. All right, thanks, Dave. Corey? Thanks. Um, I'd certainly echo a lot of what what uh, Susan and uh, David have said, and I would, I, you know, with all due respect to the applicant, I'm I'm not, I haven't been very reassured about the the answers that are available at this at this stage, and it may just be that there's more due diligence that the applicant needs to do, and maybe some that the town needs to do uh, to the extent that that's appropriate. Um, and it, I guess the image that I keep having of this water issue, and I, I agree with Susan that the um, the wetlands themselves, strictly speaking, as delineated here, are a major concern. There's also just a general ambient water table issue here, and it's a very flat area. And the image that I keep having is of a quote-unquote flat table where if you spill a liquid on it, it's going to sort of spread in all different directions and and if you keep pouring water or whatever liquid it's going to kind of there may be a net movement in one direction or another but at some point the, the moisture is going to work its way into a lot of different areas and that's kind of the image that i keep having particularly thinking about a 2001 study which is in itself sort of a snapshot and there may have been a a net a net movement in in one direction, but based on a lot of the anecdotal evidence that, that we're hearing, it sounds like you know the, the water's always there, um, either at the surface or just below it. Um, and at the end of the day, it's almost almost feels sort of academic to be talking about well, what's the 
ultimate direction which it's going to go. And then once it's there, it's really still part of the same almost closed system, it feels like. And I'm not a, you know, I, I'm not a hydrologist or anything, but um, that's, the, that's the sense that I have based on some of the, again, anecdotal things that we've heard and to the extent that we looked at some of the peer review. Um, so I, you know, at this point I would consider myself definitely a, a skeptic um, and I would need to see more information and, uh, I, you know, I, to me this also is a, it's an example of a, I think, a, an issue I've had in general with some of these conservation subdivisions and I'll say, you know, that generally speaking, conceptually, I'm, I'm a fan of them and I, and I, I understand the, the planning principles behind them and I, I think that they're, they can be very successful and accomplish some some good goals and good be good planning but it seems to me sometimes that we see some of these proposals that are just they're just sort of they feel kind of shoehorned in and and that you know to me beyond you know below a certain what feels like a critical mass it just doesn't feel like it's really um, it seems like it's more trouble than it's worth for lack of a better term a very non-technical way to put it um, and so I, sometimes when I find myself looking at proposals like this, I, I just end up feeling like, well, you know, we're going through all this for three, three house lots, um, and we're impacting wetlands, and we're potentially exacerbating a water issue for existing residents. So, um, you know, I, I'm always open to more information, and it sounds like we have a lot of questions here, and there certainly are the questions around chain of title and covenants and restrictions, which, um, you know, there are times when those questions get raised in an almost kind of pro forma way by people who are looking to stall a project or something like that. But I think in this case, there are some legitimate, very valid questions uh, that I think merit further review. So um, let's uh, <coughs> at this point. Thank you, Gary. I'm ready? Well, I'd like Corey to go first. Yeah, <laughs> first is a lot, a lot of stuff that I had to say. Uh, I kind of agree. And you know, when you first looked at this, what you tried to accomplish uh, with the drainage of the road, it looked okay. But then you look at this whole area uh, from the elevations we're showing on our sheets, we're only talking basically three <clears throat> feet difference between all you guys' properties out there. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm ready to approve something to dump that much more water. I'm not necessarily concerned about the individual lots. I'm more concerned about the road itself, I'm dumping that much more water in that area that's very low. I'd like to see some more elevations, if possible. Uh, Robert Coppola's lot, I'd like to see some <coughs> elevations close to that to see how would that's going to impact him. I don't see anything there. And we see the Cloney, uh, looks like <laughs> we're going to dump a ton of water in his property. That elevation is correct. We're talking going from 142 to 133. Uh, that looks like a pretty good impact to me as far as that particular lot. Which property was that, sir? Uh, Philip Clooney, uh, which is at the end near lot two. Showing an elevation here of 133. <coughs> going from 142 into the 140, uh, 140.8 or so. It actually looks like it's going to severely dump into that person's property. Um, never mind the whole area being wetland to begin, to begin with, but it looks like it's going to dump a lot in his area. That's all I've got. Just like to see some more elevations, see where, this actual, where the water is actually flowing. Thanks, John. That one else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think, I think this, uh, all of my colleagues here have done a wonderful job of explaining the, the major areas of concern. Um, philosophically, I'm one of those people that if you own a piece of property, I'm, I believe that you should be able to, within reasonable standards, do what you, what you would like would, to do with it. Um, however, I do happen to have a conscience, and I think putting three new people in the middle of a big puddle like this, without proper... Um, attention to how you can mitigate the, some of that water issue would would be a big stumbling block for me. 
and, and you know, understand where I'm coming from. That's, you know, I, I it just, there's got to be a lot of work done to convince me, and it sounds like the rest of this board, that um, we're not going to exacerbate the problem at all, and that we can take um, very certain measures to try to mitigate it, uh, even, even help out some of the existing homeowners, although that's not necessarily your responsibility would kind of be the right thing to do if you have the heavy equipment already out there playing in the sand. Um, that would be my personal um, twist to this. I, from as far as more technical standpoint, you mentioned a need, f uh, you know, a request for a waiver on the traffic impact study. Um, as far as my personal feelings on that, that would be I think three new houses do not warrant a traffic study. It's my opinion. So if you needed some guidance there on at least where one of the board members might be leaning, I would be I would be okay with waiving a traffic study. Um, as far as the other request, which is uh, a nitrate analysis, I'm not certain. Um, I would be supportive of. Although I, I'm always willing to learn more um, of skipping any process that's going to have to deal with the the land itself at this point. So that's that's the extent of my comments. Thank you. Um, obviously, water is probably the number one concern that we're going to have to deal with. Um, some of my concerns in regards to that is. is and this always becomes very difficult to me because I, I have a very layman's concept of stormwater management. And, you know, we joke sometimes that you only need to know three things to be a plumber kind of thing, right? <laughs> uh, one of them being water runs downhill. Correct. Um, <clears throat> in my vision of this, what I always struggle with is the fact that we put a development in how we deal with water, how we move water. The fact of the matter is the water is the water is the water, and the development doesn't add water. The rain is what's going to come down, or the snow is what's going to melt. And it's not the development that changes the amount of water. But what it potentially is, is that the development can direct the water um, depending upon how it's built. For the eight and a half years that I've been on this board, I would say that the majority of the time we've been successful in taking water and directing it better than what Mother Nature might have directed it in terms of individual property owners. Because we have the opportunity with a fresh piece of ground, if you will, to be able to say if we can take all the water and move it in one given direction, then we stand the chance to redirect water that was causing a butter problems to an area where the water can physically be handled better, moved better, and hopefully through modern technology and engineering, we can improve a site more than we can cause harm. And I think we accomplish that more often than not. I don't sit here and say that we're perfect, but I think we do a fairly decent job at trying to make that happen. So the onus is on you to help us understand how you're going to make that happen on this site so that not only the members of this board are comfortable with that, but the members who have got up and uh, talked to us this evening can feel more comfort as well um, as we move through. That's all I want to say about the water side of it. In terms of the public road, the onus is on you to get together with the DPW to get them to want to accept the road. Mm -hmm. Cut and dry. <coughs> yep. um, If that's not the case, Dan, mm -hmm. can you help us understand about services that might be provided? 
uh, on a private road or how that might be impacted as was addressed by one of the public. Sure. Yeah, in <coughs> most cases, um, there are town services that can go down private roads. There's concern about um, recycle bins and garbage bins being collected um, at the end of the road on the public road. Um, in the past, the waste management company is willing to enter into private agreements with um, lot owners along private roads. That's an extra fee, though, so that needs to be um, something that's paid above and beyond your property taxes to, to do that, but they're willing to go down um, most paved roads. In the case of a 20 or 22-foot wide road they'd be, that has an adequate turnaround, they could go down and collect um, solid waste and recycling, etc. cetera. Um, mail is something that's outside the control of the town, so I certainly can't give you a definitive answer as to whether there would be mailboxes on a private road or a, a cluster at its intersection with Sarah Liberty. Um, so um, I don't know that that relieves fears or not, but that is done in many private roads in town where there's um, fees paid so that the private hauler will, will go down those roads. Thanks, Dan. Um, it, I'm not comfortable yet as to whether or not we have covenants that will impact this property, and I, and I think that staff also has some concerns that we've heard that have been brought up. Somehow we have to um, make a determination what is and what is not a playbill mm -hmm. in terms of the covenants before we can go further. My personal feeling on the plume analysis waiver is no. I think here, especially because of the water issues, I think we have to be extra careful in terms of what's going to happen to that, where it's going to happen, and how do we manage it. Okay. Um, one of the questions <coughs> that I also have is in regards to, is there any... I don't know how we get this data, but one of my concerns is that if we have this surface water, how, how often do we have the surface water? What's the, per, what's the percentage of time that the surface water is there? And where I'm going with this primarily is how might that impact any net residential calculation that we should be making on this site? If we have a substantial amount of surface water present for a pick percentage, I don't know what the right percentage is, but if, we're, if we have standing water 25% of the year, should that be considered lots that are usable and buildable? I mean, I, I just have a question. I don't know how to answer that question, but I, I don't know if there is a mm -hmm. uh, best practice that would address that, and if there is, could you help me with that? I, you don't have to do it now. Okay. When you come back. Okay. Um, traffic study. I also, like Nick, don't have a problem with. I don't think we need to do a traffic study for three houses. Yeah, it's just an impact yeah. value, and yeah, it's we an agree with it. Value. I think yeah. you know, Thank trip you. ends and the trip ends on three houses that fits pretty yeah. straight and dry, cut forward. I don't think we have to go too too far with that. Um, and I guess I will go back to the water one more time, but in terms of the water movement, especially, um, geez, it's just all over. How do we control it going from this development to the properties that are going to be like on the north side or up towards home road? Home road? Mm -hmm. And can we determine what happens if we take all the surface water down the road? In, you know, you're trying to redirect it. I appreciate all of that. But that water potentially has never gone there before. So how do we predict what's going to happen with all of that extra water going down into the wetlands and how that's going to spread? That can be done. If we can. Yep. If we can. Yep. There's you know, calculations for that. Calc that out. I think that would be helpful as well. <clears throat> um, 
based on the notes that I met of the uh, comments that were made by the public, I think we've addressed most of the items, and hopefully we haven't missed any. <coughs> so, at least the ones that, but the ones that I wrote down, and I think I, I've got the majority of them. So. Any other comments by the board? Any? I just add that I would agree with, with you and Nick on the, the waiver requests. Yes on traffic study, no on nitrate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what else can we do for you tonight? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a long night. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have all this done tonight. Um, there was one question, Mr. Chairman, from the board. Somebody said they were looking up DEP permits. Uh, oh, yeah perhaps on maybe on the earlier development. Uh, my notes say that when Sarah Liberty Lane was developed and engineered by another engineer, not BH2M, uh, that that uh, uh, received a permit by rule of stormwater. Mm -hmm. So there would not be a, uh, much of a file on it. There should be a copy of that to the town. But that's a permit that's granted in 14 days by DEP if they see no issues. So that would have been the only permit. And that's what we will be charged with if we move forward with this project with DEP is a permit by rule for stormwater. Okay. And, and again, I just want to clarify, you know, there's been a lot of comments about impacting the wetlands. We're not impacting the wetlands. We're not touching a square foot of the wetlands. We're bringing stormwater to it, but we're not impacting it by the sense of needing a permit or anything but, like no, that. No, I, I, I said, and if, if I alluded to that, my, yeah. my comment really was yeah. more the impact of the water. Bringing the water the to it. The additional water coming into the wetlands. Correct. Yes. Thank you. That's what I meant by the impact. I did not think you were disturbing. Yep. Okay. So, and, and in fact, <coughs> for the conservation subdivision is so that you don't have to sit there and touch any of it. Correct. That's the beauty of it. So, I mean, yep. so I, I, I do appreciate that. So, if you're good with us. I'm good with that list. What? Maybe, <laughs> that's enough of a list for you to work on tonight? <coughs> okay. I'm busy. Um, Thank you. Then we're good then. So. Thank you. It would be unusual, but I'm feeling good tonight. Good, because I have one too. I know. I want to go home, guys. We take it down. The wetland doesn't stop here. There's another 10 acres of wetland right here. So all the concerns about the water pouring out here, I assume, would also yeah, where is it going to go I mean that's I think same, that's, same question. That, that's basically what I what I'm asking uh, mr. Thompson to look at is yeah. what happens to the water where does it go right I, I noticed that there was no indication of what over here, but there are there's plenty yeah and it's it's merely the yeah. site that he was in the design so yeah, like mm -hmm. yeah. not Thank trying you. to hide it that's basically the reason I asked for the elevations is to see where this is going. I see a little bit of elevations to the right hand, left hand side of that, but don't see anything on the other side to see where the water actually is going to go. I'll allow one more question. Good. <laughs> the question that I have is this. If we construct this road, whatever it is, 700 feet long or whatever, times 22 feet wide. Are we, are we building this road up? Yes. Okay. And, and the three house lots will also be built up, correct? Okay, so essentially, if I was to come in here with, you know. Question couple, and a comment, by yeah, the way. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Careful, don't be a question. Okay. Are we essentially taking away storage from this wetlands? If we we're, we're creating storage in some sense by putting it through the affiliate and then directing the water to them. I'm not taking away storage from the land. Yeah, but see, if you're sitting in a hot tub, right, and you get a glass, you're not going to direct the water anywhere. I, I think what we really need to do is we really need to see what his study comes back with because it's, it's – Hypothetical at this point. You, 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 you understand? In other words, when, when you add a second person to the hot tub, the water comes up. It's got no place to go. I think if, it's been established that we understand the question. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. But no, thank you. I, we appreciate what you're saying, but I, until we actually see the results of the study, it's very, very difficult to. Okay. We can 
try to look at this six different ways. None of us are professional, except except the man and the wife. Could you do the study in the springtime? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, our next item on our agenda this evening is an administrative amendment report. Mr. Baker. I'm not aware of any. Are you, Mr. Chair? I am not aware of any okay. either. A town plan report? Yeah, I have a couple announcements for the board. Um, and perhaps Mr. Chase has updated you in the last few months. Um, but uh, planning staff and the Long Range Planning Committee have been working on possible amendments as it relates to the town's ability to um, have what they call municipal capacity for what's for site law development review by DEP. Right now, DEP reviews larger development projects in Scarborough for their impacts on a wide range of things, wildlife habitat, historic resources, um, aesthetics, um, development footprint, that type of thing. The town's been interested in pursuing local uh, capacity or administration of that as a way to um, make development review more efficient as well as to actually incentivize development in our, in our growth areas. It's an allowance that's only allowed by the state within our business zones or where we're uh, encouraging development, not in the rural areas. Um, so there are a set of amendments that will be coming forward to the council. Uh, one in your uh, site plan review ordinance about historic resources and making sure that um, we're reviewing um, historic properties before development occurs there and also concerning wildlife habitat. Both of those are currently done by the state. But with those amendments, um, the town would be found competent uh, and comprehensive enough in our ordinances to do that locally. Um, so it provides, it puts a little bit more uh, onus on the planning board in terms of what you review, but it also makes development review more seamless, not as long for uh, applicants, because typically that review takes could take four to six months at the state level. Um, and the Long Range Planning Committee has been working on um, what those amendments look like. And they're going to go to the council in the next month or so. And I wanted to provide you a heads up in that regard. And also, um, we'll be providing you the actual amendments so that the board understands them before they get adopted by the, by the council. Um, so there would be amendments in the site plan ordinance and the subdivision ordinance. Um, regarding that capacity or local authority. Um, the other thing worth noting for the board and also any viewers at home, um, the transportation committee's been working on cross, a proposal for crosswalk improvements and other improvements <coughs> at the Oak Hill intersection, um, really as a second phase to the sidewalk that went in along Black Point Road last fall and also is part of the larger effort to continue to make Oak Hill um, um, more friendly to pedestrians and um, crosswalks, et cetera, to complement what Biddeford Savings Bank did down at Hanford Drive. And uh, next Wednesday, there's going to be a half an hour workshop or so before the town council meeting with the town council for the transportation committee and staff to present um, the improvements around Oak Hill, get their feedback in anticipation of continuing design work on that and maybe construction later in the uh, summer or fall to, again, improve crosswalks, to actually add the missing, what's now a missing length of sidewalk along the gas station between the, uh, the new assisted living facility to put in a sidewalk and the Oak Hill intersection. Um, so if you're interested in that, it would be at 6.30 to 7. Or um, you can watch at home. Um, so those are a couple updates as to what's being worked on in the planning <coughs> department, also transportation committee. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, in terms of correspondence, anything other than <coughs> the emails that have already been mentioned? Anybody receive any? No. Nope. Any planning board comments this evening? Only I won't be at the next meeting. Thank you for the heads up on that. Sunny, sunny floor. Beautiful place to be. Chair would entertain a motion. Yes, David. Um, are we going to have a workshop at the next before the next meeting, or 
Last I knew it was the 31st the third, of yeah. March. Okay. I think we have a full <coughs> board at the 31st. Um, so to, in order to accommodate John's trip to Florida, we're going to wait until March 31st. Okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? We have a second as well. Uh, Dave, I think Nick got it first. Any discussion? All in favor? 